let's get started. I want to make a few announcements before we actually get into the class. Um, first, as I said, we do have the books available for this class. This is Church History 1, which means it is from the Apostolic Age, the time immediately following Jesus, pretty much from Pentecost, up until um, about the year 1500, which is immediate pre-Reformation. The Reformation really started in 1517. So we are going to be dealing with the first 1500 years of the church. This book, um, I'm going to talk, uh, well, I'll do that right now, but because this doesn't need to be videotaped. Um, this book by Bruce Shelley called uh, Church History in Plain Language, I think is a really excellent book. Um, there's another really excellent book that I really struggled with which one to pick, and this is one that John uh, Whitener had recommended to me as well, and that is a book by Russo Gonzalez called The Story of Christianity. Um, he's a, a Cuban uh, a scholar. Both of these are wonderful books, and both of them are very readable, very interesting, it flows, it's not heavy academic stuff. Um, and I'm going to be using Russo Gonzalez's book a lot in preparation for lectures and things, but the these are pretty much equal in my mind, and the reason why I selected this one as your textbook is that Shelley's book covers the whole of church history, which means you buy one book and you can use this for the second church history class from the Reformation to modern times, whereas Gonzalez's book, this early, uh, early church history to the dawn of the Reformation, you'd have to buy a second book for the second class. Other than that, I think they're both really excellent. But I will be referring quite often to uh, Justo Gonzalez's uh, book, The Story of Christianity. And if you're looking, if you get interested in this and want to get something else, this should be the next book you buy. Okay? But I do have these books, Church History and Plain Language, for 250 pesos, if you would like to pick those up at the break. Um, How much is Gonzalez's book? Oh, I don't know. Oh, okay. Uh, I don't have it available for sale. Uh, but USA, it's $25.99. You can probably, probably get a little less than that from uh, from. Amazon. So this other book is, actually I got a pretty good discount because it's like 30 bucks US and I'm selling it to you for 250 pesos. So, um, okay, <clears throat> let me go ahead and open with a word of prayer and then we'll get into some of the other details. Our Father and our God, we thank you for the fact that you are a God who has revealed himself in history. We thank you that from the start when your son became incarnate as Jesus in Bethlehem, through his death and resurrection, through the start of the early church and the spread of the good news that you have acted in history. And we appreciate our ability to go back and look at that and study it, that this is one of the ways you have revealed yourself to us. We ask you now to guide us in this class. Bless the words that I speak, that I might be organized and communicating what needs to be heard. Bless the ears that hear and the hearts that receive, that your Holy Spirit would be guiding us all along the way. We pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, I do have to do um, one other thing. For those of you who weren't in the other two classes, I have to do this at the start of each class, I feel. The policies and requirements for Lakeside Institute of Theology. We are licensed by the government to offer certificates and degrees. And as some of you have heard me say already, as of this term, this will be our 7th, 8th, and ninth uh, courses that we offer this term, because we've had two terms before this. And so our first level of certificate, a certificate of biblical studies, is available after eight courses. Um, and so some people will be eligible for certificate after this course. If there are any of the previous courses you have not taken, then all of them are available online. You can review the videotapes of the lectures. You can review all of the PowerPoint materials, either as PowerPoint or as PDFs. Online, our website is litchapala.org. LIT stands for Lakeside Institute of Theology, litchapala.org. You can go on and check those out. Um, and then we have a second level of certificate, which is uh, 12 classes. We then have a master's degree, a master, master of biblical studies, and a master of biblical studies and ministry. Uh, so that we will, and the potential is there for us to ordain. We are recognized by the government of Mexico as being legitimate not only for offering degrees but also for ordaining people. And, and, but to do that, we require for people to get the right training. So, if you are interested in either the certificates or the degrees, then these policies and requirements uh, affect you. And this is all the policies and requirements we have. You know, we don't have books full of stuff. Number one, all of the classes are free, but all students seeking a certificate or degree must purchase the books in paper, not electronic. 
There are reasons for that. I can't refer people to a chart on page 97 or to read from this page to this page if they've got a, a book on Kindle because it doesn't line them up that way. So I ask you to buy the books. I have made one exception to that for someone that had a special reason why Kindle, only Kindle would work for them. So talk to me if that's a problem. But I do ask you to buy the books if you want a certificate or degree. Second, if you're in the degree or certificate programs, you may miss no more than one class per course without arrangements made in advance with the teacher to make up the missed work. Ordinarily, what I do is simply, if I talk to you, if it's going to be, you miss one class, you're fine. If you're going to miss two classes or more, I require you to go online, review the video, review the materials uh, that are there, and then send me an email confirming you have done so. I trust you, but you do have to go through the process and then tell me you've done it. Um, if somebody wants to take large chunks of the courses, uh, just online, not being present, then I want to talk to you about that because I think there's some value to being here in person. Third, the students and certificate or degree tracks will be required to take a pass-fail exam in each course based on study guidelines provided by the teacher. About three quarters of the way through this class, I will give you a document that is called what you need to know from Church History 1. And I will tell you everything that you need to know. If you study that document, you not only will know the important stuff, but you'll be able to ace the test. Um, and then I try very hard to make the test a learning experience too for people. And so um, I encourage you, even if you're not doing this for a degree or certificate, to study the materials and to take the test because you will learn the stuff better. Is that true for those of you who have done that? Yes. Okay. Um, so I, I encourage you in that regard. Students in the certificate or degree tracks uh, must make a passing grade based upon pass-fail in each course in order to receive credit toward a certificate or degree. That means you have to either attend seven of the eight classes or review the materials you miss online and confirm with me by email. And then you have to make a score of at least 65 or more on the test. I have a fairly lenient grading uh, uh, curve. 90 to 100 is an A. And I don't even use A's, A's and B's, but so you know, 90 to 100 is an A, 80 to 90 is a B, 70 to 80 is a C, uh, 65 to 70 is a D, and below that, you need to take it again. All right? I will allow you to take the test more than once if you have to. Candidates for degrees of Master of Theology and Master of Theology of Ministry must be approved by the Institute Director, that's me, before final admission into a degree program. I have to talk to you about it if you want to do this for one of the advanced degrees. Okay? Any questions about that? We don't need to revisit this. All of this stuff is online. Uh, I only have to do it before the first class of each course. So, Church History 1. This is the outline, and again, all of these materials are available on the internet. Uh, this is the outline for our class. As I always say, I reserve the right as I go along to make changes to this. As I study and prepare, I may decide to either reorder things or to add things that I don't, you know, I hadn't thought of before or whatever. But as of right now, today we're going to do an introduction to church history. Next week we are going to deal with the apostolic age, which is uh, from the apostles to Catholic Christianity. Pretty much, uh, in that case, it's from AD 30, about the time of the Pentecost, up until the death of the, uh, the last of the apostles, which was John, who died around 100. So the first period, and that's the point at which the church became Catholic. It was still sort of universal. Catholic means universal. If you ever wonder why in the creeds we say we believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church, you'll notice it's not with a capital C. It doesn't mean Roman Catholic. It means universal. That's why that's still part of the creed. So next week, apostles to the Catholic Christianity, the apostolic era. The next week will be persecution, heresies, and the book. You can guess which book I'm talking about. Uh, fourth week, and this will generally follow a sequence of the history of the church, the first 1,500 years, but not exactly, not directly, because some of these topically relate to each other, even if they don't line up exactly chronologically. Fourth week, emperors, bishops, saints, and intellectuals. Uh, you can all decide where you fit in any of these. Um, <laughs> fifth week, councils, monks, popes, and Augustine. There are only two people that I, or well, three people actually, that I believe are significant enough in the history of the church that their name goes into the outline. The first one is Augustine. Then schisms, um, barbarians, and Gregory the Great, the second one who by name is worth, uh, worthy of being put in there. 
Week seven will be Charlemagne, the third person that is worthy of this, cathedrals, crusades, and scholastics. And then week eight will be, the first hour will be poverty, inquisition, and the Babylonian captivity. And then the final exam will be the second hour of the last week. Is that clear? Any questions about that? Should be fun. This, this is, um, I mean, they're all favorite courses of mine, or I wouldn't be teaching them. But this is one that I think is too often neglected, church history. And uh, one that, if you have any interest in history, you should really enjoy it. If you don't have any, any interest in history, then wake up! <laughs> because history is really interesting if you study it right. Too many of us have had history professors who just sort of drone on and give us 900 dates to learn, and that's not the point. History is about people. It's not about dates. Okay. <laughs> That's why you'll notice I did not or organize this according to dates, although it will be generally by periods. It will be focusing on people and events that, that happened that you should find interesting. So, first question for you, what is church history? <coughs> Definition of church history, it is the story of the origin, growth, and development of the Christian faith and the Christian church starting about A.D. 30, following the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And of course, going up through, you know, today, or whichever day we're talking about it, that's part of the history of the church. Um, one of the things that people often don't, just don't bother to think about is that not only has the church developed, but our faith has developed. That doesn't mean it's changed in its fundamentals, but the, the truth of God uh, is unfolded to us as we have new experiences. You know, the, the, um, how does the Christian faith address modern ethical issues like cloning and abortion and um, the use of technology? Obviously, our Christian faith, it, God unfolds the meaning of the faith as history proceeds in order for us to know how to apply it. We do not have exactly the same Christian faith that existed in the first century AD. The fundamentals have not changed. That's why we quote the, the creeds, the oldest of which, the Apostles' Creed, started in the first century AD, was formalized in the second century. We use that creed, we use the Nicene Creed, which comes from 325, the Nicene Council, the Council of Nicaea. So we still use the ancient creeds as the basic plat platforms of the faith. But we, as we study the history, we realize that God has, has given us expanded understanding of that, has developed that faith in order to apply it to the realities of whatever time we find ourselves living in. Okay, is that fair? So, this is the definition for church history we will be using. The next question is, besides it being fun, um, why is church history important? Why is this the first of the theology classes we're teaching? The reason this is a theology class is historical theology. Is the, is the theological term. We, you know, we've been dealing with New Testament theology, uh, the NT classes we offer, Old Testament theology, the OT classes. We've got a section called Christian Maturity, which had to do with how to study the Bible and the Christian disciplines. This is the first of the classes which technically come under the category of theology, because it is historical theology. Basically, how has our understanding of God and the faith developed in history? So historical theology, it is... TH1 is the designation for this course. So, why is it important? First, we need to understand that the Christian message is rooted in the fact that God entered human history. Christianity is uniquely historical. The Hindu people do not know when, you know, the elephant god Ganesh was born. That's not a big deal to them. We know when Jesus was born. There was a particular time in history when God chose to uh, uniquely manifest His presence in the human experience. I mean, He made us, but then He became one of us. All you have to do is to read the Gospels, for instance, and see that every one of the Gospels, in one way or another, <laughs> identify the incarnation, the birth and life of Jesus Christ, as being a uniquely historical event. In Luke, Luke is the, is the section we always read in uh, Christmas time. Luke specifically identifies that Jesus was born during the reign of Augustus Caesar, when Quirinius was governor of Syria, and when, I, when this great census was being held. Historical events and facts that Luke ties the birth of Jesus to those events in human history, because it happened as part of history. The book of Matthew starts with the genealogy. 
A genealogy is an outline of people in history. We also have a genealogy in Mark. And Mark is, is Mark is the shortest of the Gospels, and he's always wanting to get to it. You know, Mark is always in a hurry to tell you what's going to happen next. And yet, Mark takes the time to give us a genealogy as well. And he, mark, he marks, so to speak, the events of Jesus' life in a historical sense. Even John, the least historically oriented, the most theological of all of the four Gospels, still says that the uh, occurrence of Jesus, the coming of Jesus, he, de he describes as that which was, was from the beginning, but which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked upon and touched with our hands. Even the theological John is concerned to make sure that we understand the incarnation of Jesus, the beginning of the Christian faith in Jesus Christ, was a historical event that people really experienced. So our Christian faith is rooted in historical events, most especially the incarnation of Jesus Christ 2,000 years ago, but then is also uh, developed throughout the 2,000 year history of the church. Okay. By the way, I don't know if I even said this in the other classes, but anytime you have a question or a comment, feel free to raise your hand. If I'm not paying attention, then yell at me, okay? Because this is about you, not about me. I already know this stuff. So let me know if you have any questions. I wish you could remember it all the time, but I do know it. Um, secondly, the history of the church also is the story of how God the Holy Spirit has continued to act through men and women of faith. So point number one is God has uniquely rooted our faith in history by the Incarnation. And for that reason it's uniquely historical. But secondly, the history of the Christian faith didn't stop with the Incarnation. Every event from Pentecost, which is where we start our study of Christian history, of the history of the Church, from Pentecost on is a manifestation of the presence of the Holy Spirit in the lives and hearts of men and women of God. And so as we study the events of the church, we are studying what the Holy Spirit has been doing in the lives of those people. This morning, um, in the Bible study, we had a question about, are, well, are any new scriptures ever added? Um, and the answer to that is no. The, you know, the canon is considered closed. Now, I won't get into that whole discussion. If you want to have a question, stop me at the break. But um, the, the person who asked the question went on to say, well, then, you know, we haven't really heard from God in 2,000 years. You know, why haven't we received more messages from God? And I said, oh, we have. Just because the written scripture, the canon, is closed, meaning we believe that it's finished, doesn't mean God has stopped communicating with us. At Pentecost, the Holy Spirit came into the heart of everyone who had received Jesus Christ, and we continue to receive comfort and teaching and exhortation and conviction of sin. I always got to include that one. Um, by the presence of the Holy Spirit. And all of the major events of the church are manifestations of the presence of the Holy Spirit. Again, in Bible study this morning, I quoted my brother once said he had read something, I think it was probably one of Dan Brown's novels, in Da Vinci Code or whatever, about how a bunch of men got together and decided which of these books should be the Bible and which one shouldn't be, which one should be included as the divinely inspired Word of God and which ones got left out. And he said he wasn't okay with that. And I said, well, you're troubled by the fact that a bunch of men decided what was the inspired word of God. Well, a bunch of men wrote it. <laughs> if we believe that God could have inspired the men who wrote it, we also believe that God the Holy Spirit could have led and directed and inspired the people who decided this is God's message to us and these things aren't. All right, And there are reasons for that. The Holy Spirit has continued to act. And so our study... Our church history is the study of how God the Holy Spirit has continued to direct and lead and manifest throughout the whole history of the church. Okay? And that's worth studying. Thirdly, without understanding the past, we really are not able to accurately understand ourselves or our faith. I say that because um, every time we sing a hymn in church, every time you hear a sermon, you are not hearing a, a purely New Testament thing because there's 2,000 years of history. There is the thinking and teaching of Martin Luther and of John Calvin and Anselm of Canterbury and Boethius and on and on and on. All of that has grown together by the inspiration of the Spirit to give us our, our modern understanding, our current understanding of what the Word of God is supposed to mean for us. 
And that has been by the direction of the Spirit. If we try to just forget everything in our past, then we lose an understanding of who we are and what we're supposed to be about. Who we are as followers of Jesus Christ has been defined not just by the life, sacrificial death, resurrection, and ascension of Jesus, but also by all the Holy Spirit has been doing. And we need to know that for us to have an accurate sense of what it means for us to be followers of Jesus Christ. Now, related to that closely is my next point, number four, and that is a knowledge of church history can keep us from repeating past mistakes and falling into past errors. Those two things are very closely related. And I'll give you two examples of that in my own experience. I told the story in some of the classes and things. I, uh, well, I taught for 18 years a class at University Presbyterian Church in Seattle, which is a big church, like 5,000 people on Sundays. And so my class was 80 to 100 people every week at 8.30 on Sunday mornings. So do not complain about having to be there for 10 o'clock service. <laughs> 80, 100 people would come. Uh, I talked for years and years, and people would ask me questions. You know, we talked about it. I got a call from a guy one day, really excited. He said, ah, I, I really need to talk to you about something. And so we arranged to get together for coffee, and I met him at the local Tully's coffee shop. And he said, I was reading, and I figured it out. I figured out what the incarnation of Jesus is all about. And I went, great. So what'd you figure out? He said, well, Jesus was just a man although a good man, up until the baptism. And when he was baptized in the Jordan River by John the Baptist, and he came out and the voice of God said, this is my son in whom I am well pleased. And the Holy Spirit was seen to descend as like a dove upon Jesus. This guy said to me, uh, that was the point at which he became divine. He wasn't divine before that. That's when God made him divine. And I went, well, <coughs> you Apparently you don't know this, but that's one of the very oldest heresies in the church. It's called adoptionism. And it comes from like the second century. And it kept raising its head through the history of the early church until finally more than one of the ecumenical councils had to squash that idea because that denies the full divinity of Jesus. It completely discounts the whole idea of the virgin birth. Why was that if he was just a human? If he was not fully God and fully human from the very start, then the theology starts to unravel. <clears throat> well, this guy knew nothing of history. If he had studied any of the history of the church for like 20 minutes, he would have come across a list of all the heresies that they had to deal with early on, called the Christological heresies, because they had to do with the nature of the human Jesus being the divine Christ. The Christological heresies. Adoptionism was one of the first ones. Well, he was mad. He got mad because I had shot, I had stuck a pin in his great new theory about how it was that Jesus was human and divine. And I went, sorry, it's not me. Go back and, you know, check out the history. Well, he didn't want to hear any of that. He was mad. That's an example of how we can make terrible mistakes if we don't know the history and know that that's been dealt with and what was said about it and what scripture were used to, uh, had been used to apply to the explanation for why that's not accurate. Another example I had uh, in my own experience, I was doing consulting with a church in Southern California. It was a, a non-denominational, completely independent church. It started by the pastor and his wife and another couple. When I started going, they would get, they'd have like three services of 1,500 people each. It is Southern California, okay? You know, mega churches on every corner, it seemed like. Well, I was doing consulting with them and I was talking to one of the elders and he told me, there were four elders, he said, my wife's part of the women's group. And she came to me and said um, that the women's group decided that they wanted to, to baptize each other. But they didn't want to tell anybody. And so they wanted to do it anonymously in a swimming pool that one of them owned and just keep it quiet. Was that okay? Well, this guy who was one of the four elders of this large church said, sure, go ahead. He's telling me this, and I'm thinking... Okay, there's a reason why that's not how the church does it. Because, one, who's making sure these women know what it is they're professing to? They could end up thinking they're fine and not have any real concept of what it means to make a profession of faith in Jesus. Because they're not talking to anybody who's supposed to have a position of leadership and of understanding to help them. And secondly, part of the whole deal is to confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord. There's a reason why it's supposed to be a public event. That's part of what the testimony is. 
Well, the reason why this elder said, sure, whatever, we're not under, we're not under authority to anybody, Dude, yeah, that's fine, is because they have no history at that church. They don't have any denominational background. They have no history. They have no constitution beyond what they wrote for themselves. There's no, and I, I'm not saying it's not possible to be a very viable and, and godly and wonderful non-denominational church. Don't misunderstand me about that. But if they had had any connection to the his, history of the church, one of the five senior people in the church, the pastor of the four elders, would have known that doing, making a profession of faith in secret and baptizing each other in secret with no consulting with somebody in leadership or anything else, that that's not okay. All right? That's a terrible thing. There may be women who are not saved but think they're okay because somebody else, you know, dumped them after they said, yes, I believe in God and in the Son, Jesus, and in the spirit of the clouds and the mountains and the trees and the, and the wolf spirit that runs across the plains, and so baptize me. And you're going, holy moly, you know. Is, are you not paying attention? That comes back to the fact they had no connection to any history of what the because the church has dealt with all those issues, and we need to be connected to that. Thomas, I think you left out a very important word on number four that it can keep us from repeating. <laughs> can keep us repeating? Oh yes, <laughs> that would be good. <laughs> Let's fix that. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Yes, thank you. Um, so any questions about that? Why we believe it is important for us to study church history? Is it clear? Is everybody good with it? Besides, it's fun. All right. Um, for those of you who were in yesterday's class, I have a, a small, not a big, but a small apology to make. Because it's, yesterday's class was on the life and teachings of Jesus. It's not possible to do an a introduction to the life and teachings of Jesus and an introduction to the, to the church history without having some overlap. Because they did sort of start at the same time in the same context, right? So I want to give you a little bit. I'm going to do a little bit different. But uh, I'm going to talk about some of the stuff that we talked about yesterday a little bit. So we really should learn it. So you really should know it. Okay? And if anybody can quote this verbatim to me right now before we start, then you're free to leave now. Okay. Um, and that is, I want to talk about the first century AD and the early church. Ron, you should appreciate this because you were talking about this right before class. <laughs> There's several points that we need to understand about um, when Jesus came to earth and what the results were of the particular time that he came to earth and then that the church uh, was responsible for spreading the gospel, the good news, which is what gospel means to the rest of the world. Um, in particular, Yesterday I focused on the, the, the passage in Galatians 4, 4, and 5, which says that, And in the fullness of time, God gave his son, born of a woman, born under law. Okay. The fullness of time means at just the right time. So I want to talk about the context historically for the coming of Jesus, which was also the context for the growth, the initial growth of the church. The first point is that Palestine was, in Jesus' time, very much the center of the world. It was the crossroads of three continents. This map, which I showed yesterday as a separate slide, is a medieval map. It has to be sometime after 1500 because it does have America floating over here insignificantly in the corner. But this map has, in the very center, Jerusalem. Up what would be to the uh, northeast of, or northwest of that is Europa, or Europe. To the northeast of it is Asia. To the south of it is Africa. That's, well, obviously this is not to scale or anything else. In terms of conceptually, that's very accurate to what the situation was in the first century. Well, still today. Jerusalem is at the crossroads. The Levant, as it was called, or Palestine, or the Holy Land, or Israel, those are all names for basically the same places. Slightly different definitions, but it's the same is very much the crossroads of three continents. And in the time of Jesus, it was the only three continents that anybody knew anything about. So it was the center of the world. As I said yesterday, if you go into the um, Church of the Holy Sepulcher in Jerusalem, they will point to a spot on the floor and say, that is the center of the universe, or the center of the world, rather. Um, that is the central point from which all things sort of emanate in the world. They used to actually refer to Jerusalem as being the navel of the universe, the belly button of the universe. Now, that has caused a great deal of suffering 
for Palestine or the Levant over the centuries because every time a major new empire or world power came along one of the major things they wanted to do was to conquer this part of the world because that meant they would control the crossroads between the three great continents and therefore they would control the trade between those places so you know the Hittites wanted to conquer this area the Assyrians did conquer the area the Babylonians conquered the area then the Persians defeated the Babylonians and then Alexander the Great defeated the Persians and then the Romans defeated the, the Greeks and on and on all of them involved in taking over this one little area. I mean, they took over other things too, but there often was a special focus on that little piece of land because it was perceived of as being the center of the universe. Now, there was a negative side to that in that they were all, always, somebody was always attacking them, but, and there was a, a lot of suffering that associated with that, but it also meant that for Jesus to have been born where he was born in Jerusalem and not in Egypt or <coughs> Asia Minor or in Susa in the, the capital of the Persian Empire further, further east or somewhere else that means that the followers of Jesus when time came for them to strike out to share this message they were in the middle and could turn in any direction and have land where the message needed to be heard okay so that was a critical part of it is that bless you is that it was very much the crossroads of, of the world, of the three major con continents at that time. Now, a second thing is that politically and culturally, this was the perfect time, uh, this was the perfect environment for Jesus to come and for the church to grow. I talked about uh, there, there are three particular reasons. There's actually more than three, but three that I would mention. The, I talked about yesterday, again, doesn't have a to go over this again, uh, the Pax Romana. In 63... B.C., um, the, and I won't get into a lot of detail about the history of this, but the Romans were invited to come in by the Jewish rulers, the Hasmoneans, who had thrown out the Seleucids, that is, the, the Greek rulers, and, yet, and then they started fighting amongst themselves, the Hasmoneans, the Jewish kings, or kings or would-be kings. So they invited the Romans to come down and, and, and be on their side. Well, the Romans obliged them, because this was the time of the great ascendancy of Rome, the first century B.C., in 63 BC, Pompey, the great Roman general, who later would become emperor for a while, uh, Pompey comes in, sweeps into the area, and besieges Jerusalem and conquers it and takes over Jerusalem and all the surrounding area for the Romans. The reason why that's especially significant is that that was the time where the Pax Romana, or the Peace of Rome, P-E-A-C-E, -E, the Roman peace was manifest in the world. At that point, Rome controlled everything. There was no competition for them in the, the, the end of the first century BC, the start of the first century AD. Of course, they didn't call it then back, that back then. We changed the calendar based upon the birth of Jesus. But um, Rome controlled everything. There were no borders. There was no limitation to where you could go. There was no fear that somebody else was going to attack Palestine during this time or anywhere else because during the life of Jesus and for hundred, well, almost 200 years of the early church, Rome controlled the world. And you could go anywhere within Rome without having to have a passport or permission, if you, especially if you're a Roman citizen, but if you just obeyed the laws. They also, not only was it a matter that you weren't going to be attacked by Hittites along the way, or, or Persians, or Greeks, or anybody else who would challenge the Romans, the Romans also pretty much did away with piracy on the, on the Mediterranean Sea. So that by the time Paul starts getting on boats and traveling places by sea, the only thing he had to really fear were, um, were storms, you know, being shipwrecked, which happened. He didn't fear pirates anymore. A hundred years before Jesus... There could have been the danger of foreign powers coming in. There were huge dangers of pirates. There was much greater danger from robbers and brigands. There were still robbers around. I mean, we have the story, for instance, of the, you know, the Good Samaritan, where a man is, is, is beaten up by robbers on the way to Jericho. But it had been reduced so much because of the peace of Rome. That made it a perfect time, not only for Jesus to be incarnate, for the religion to start, but for people to spread it. Two other reasons, the Roman roads. The Romans built tens of thousands of kilometers of roads. 
you could get on a Roman road, know where it was going, and know you were going to be able to get there and not be stuck in the mud on, on you know, the, some pass in the middle of the mountains. And that periodically along there, there were going to be Roman outposts, so that, that would increase the safety. Um, the travels that we have by sea, of course, but also by land of the missionaries, they traveled on Roman's roads. You know, you go today to Philippi, and you'll see a post there, a sign, carved in stone, the Via Ignatia. From Corinth all the way to Rome, there's a road that the Romans built. And throughout the whole Roman Empire, you still find these Roman roads. I think I asked yesterday, how many of you have ever seen some of the Roman roads that exist? They still have the stones there. Okay. And the third reason is the Greek language. Because, and it wasn't just the Romans, because Alexander the Great had conquered the whole known world before dying at age 33. Now they always say, you know, by the time Alexander was my age, he'd been dead for 22 years. You know, um, he conquered the whole world by 33 and then died. But in the process of conquering the world, he introduced Greek culture and the Greek language. Why is that important? Why is that actually a miraculous sign of God's providence? Because that means when Peter and Paul and Philip and all of the apostles and all the other missionaries, Apollo and Priscilla and Aquila and all these people, when they were traveling and wanted to talk to people about this Jesus who is the Messiah, promised Son of God, they knew they could talk to whoever they wanted because everybody spoke Greek. Everybody. Everybody spoke at least two languages. They spoke whatever language their culture called for, and they all spoke Greek. This is why the New Testament is written in Greek. It's not written in Hebrew or Aramaic, which was the common language amongst the Jews at that time. That was the language they learned when they were in exile in Babylon. Um, it's written in Greek because everybody read Greek. Paul could show up at any synagogue, any town square, in any city in Rome, in the Roman Empire, start talking in Greek, and people would understand it, which is a, a miraculous thing. These are just a few of the ways in which the unique time in history, not only for the Incarnation, for the start of the of faith based upon Jesus as becoming a human, but also for the expansion of the faith. We also have the fact that economically it was the perfect time for a new message of hope. Uh, two out of every three um, people in Rome at this time were slaves. The, the, the area of Palestine, again, they kept getting conquered by people. And at the time of Jesus, they not only, the people were not only paying taxes to Rome, they also were paying taxes to Herod the Great at the time of Jesus' birth, because Herod was a huge builder. He built he built the second temple. He built all, well, he didn't build it. He, he uh, renovated it completely. Apparently, it's a pretty sorry sight uh, after uh, Ezra and the others, Ezra and Nehemiah and the others, finished with building the wall of the city and rebuilding the temple. So, um, they built it, yeah, but they said, man, look at that. Compare that to the original Solomon's temple. This is sorry <laughs> stuff. I mean, scripture talks about how bad it was. And then Herod comes along, Herod the Great, and he completely re he redoes, he renovates in a major way the temple so that it began as a spectacular place. Well, he paid for all that by taxing the people. So they're paying taxes to Rome, they're paying taxes to Herod, they're paying taxes to the temple itself, and this is a period of, of the world, of a place in the world that often has famines, that often has economic trials because of the meteorological stuff. It was a terrible time economically for the Jewish people, which is one of the reasons why the Jews were always wanting to rebel against Rome when they controlled it, is because this is one less tax we'd have to pay if we got rid of those guys. So it was, people were looking for some sort of hope to get them out from under the burden they felt. And finally, morally and religiously, the world was tired and frustrated and ready for a change. Now, I'm going to talk a little bit later about the, the Jewish kind of setting and the parties amongst the Jews that were there. But uh, suffice it to say that the Roman gods and the Greek gods, which were the same gods, as I said yesterday, the Romans were very economical. They did not come up with their own gods. They stole gods from everybody else and gave them, gave them Latin names. So the Roman pantheon of gods is exactly the same as the Greek pantheon of gods. Plus they, add, they kept adding them as they went along, you know. Um, Dionysus is Bacchus. For instance, and on and on, you know, they, they, they dual purpose gods. So the Romans had this pantheon, but these gods were all off somewhere else. They were on Olympus. The only time in the Greek mythology that they interacted with people was when they were tormenting them. And so this is not 
very personal. It's not like people could get a lot of personal satisfaction out of a relationship with those gods. And they were old and tired, and they had, the stories had run their course, and people didn't really care about that anymore. As a result of that, I'll talk about this a little bit later, there was um, an effort to try to find some kind of meaning, both morally and religiously or spiritually. The people began to investigate mystery religions, other religions that came from other parts of the world. Whoa. Um, the uh, religions like the, re the Egyptian religions of Isis and Osiris, the Persian religion of Mithra, uh, the Mithraism, which, would, which he was sort of a militant soldier god, and the, the armies of Rome love god Mithra. Um, you have Sibylle, the mother of the gods, was called. It came out of Asia Minor, that became one of the most popular you know, god figures. All of these mystery religions, they were more personal than the Roman and Greek gods. You, um, they were more egalitarian. Slaves and wealthy people would stand shoulder to shoulder in these services, these worship events, to these mystery religion gods. Um, and there was a sense in which these gods were closer by, that you would have ceremonies in which the gods were expected to be present. That was not true with the Roman gods or the, the Greek gods. So a very different kind of approach. And again, this, this sort of moral and religious uh, exhaustion was also true, I believe, for the, uh, the Jews to a great extent. I'm going to talk about that a little bit later. So these are some of the reasons why the first century was a critical time, not only for the Incarnation again, but for the launching of this new religion into the world. Why evangelism, the missionary efforts, of all of the apostles and other followers were so effective. There also are a number of quite miraculous other events I didn't talk about. For instance, the, the diaspora of the Jews. The word diaspora means spreading out. Okay? Well, the Jews had, had experienced a couple of diasporas. They experienced a diaspora under the Babylonian, and when the Babylonians destroyed uh, Judah in the south, the southern kingdom of Judah. I'm going to give you some detail about that in a minute because it's relevant to this uh, spiritual exhaustion of the Jews. But the result was they took them off into exile. Well, later when the Persians conquered the Babylonians, they let them go back, but actually not very many of them, compared, relatively speaking, went back. Instead, they either settled in Mesopotamia, in Babylon, they spread out and went to Persia. You know, there were a lot of Jews living in Susa. That's the story of Esther. Esther and Mordecai, her uncle, and all the Jews that lived there um, in the city of Susa, the, from the book of Esther, that was the capital of Persia. Um, we have uh, Jonah going to the city of Nineveh. Nineveh, in the north of Mesopotamia, was the capital city of the Assyrians. Obviously, we have Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in Babylon, the capital of the Babylonian Empire. And on and on. There were Jewish populations in all over the known world. You know, when Paul traveled, he would always, he would go to Asia Minor. He would go to Greece. First thing he would do, you know, he'd land, go to his hotel, unpack his bag. The next morning, he'd get up early and he would go to the synagogue. Because there was almost always a synagogue, a Jewish gathering place. After he spoke to the Jews, then he would go to the public square and talk to the Gentiles. The Jews were scattered everywhere. And what that meant was because Christianity started as an offshoot of Judaism and was very Jewish early on, all of the early believers were Jews. Every one of those places where Jewish communities were, every one of those Jewish synagogues was an ideal place to go and talk about what God had done in sending finally, finally, the Messiah, his promised Messiah. And so the early growth of the Christian church was significantly aided by the fact the Jews had been scattered out because of having been conquered, and the diaspora, the spreading out of the Jews, gave target locations and populations for the spreading of the gospel. It's also true, persecution, it's, it's always been said that the, the growth of the church is uh, from the blood of the martyrs. Okay, The blood of martyrs is the growth of the church. Um, the first great persecution of Jews by uh, of Christians by Jews was following the martyrdom of Stephen in the book of Acts. Stephen is the first Christian martyr. He was stoned by Jews. Paul, who was then called Saul, who was not yet a Christian, he was an enthusiastic young Turk of a, of a Jew, he was present, and after that, he started off on a trips to try to arrest these uh, Christians, followers of Crestus, who were considered to be heretics, and bring them back for trial. 
And so that persecution that happened after Stephen, uh, most of the Christians in Jerusalem ran for it. The Jerusalem Council did not. The leaders of the church stayed in Jerusalem. Most of them took off and went somewhere else. Well, that's how the gospel spread. Because of persecution, the gospel spread. I give you these as sort of bits and pieces of ways in which God used quite extraordinary historical circumstances. Everything from Alexander making people speak Greek, to the Romans building roads, to uh, the Jews being scattered out by the Babylonian exile, to the Christians being scattered out by the persecution after Stephen's death. All of these pieces fit together in the history of the church that led to the fact that between you know, the 30 AD and 300 AD, Christianity had already become a significant force. Even, even when it was still illegal, it had already become a significant force in the Roman Empire. Uh, questions about any of that? This is all background kind of stuff, remember? Any, uh, Bob? One thing that's a little troublesome to me in this sort of history of the Western civilization of which is that huge great civilizations in China, India, and the Americas are almost totally ignored. Yeah, supposedly the Apostle Thomas touched on the east coast of India. Right. I don't know how he even got there. But, mm -hmm. And I'm not sure when Christianity reached China, but apparently Christianity did not even reach the Americas until 1,500 years later. That, that's always kind of puzzled me. Well, again, what you're saying basically is that God has used history. I mean, you're making the point I started with, and that is the unfolding of the faith to humanity has happened in history. God has chosen to use history. Uh, Thomas's travel to India would have been included in this lobe of, you know, India was known, and that was Asia. So the Indian, the influence of the Indian cultures, and the, the tradition is that Thomas went to India and planted the church there, and there is a very ancient Indian church. One of the most ancient of the Christian churches that exists is in Ethiopia. And it's believed because Israel, from the time of Solomon, had a relationship through the relationship between Solomon and Queen of Sheba to um, Ethiopia. That's why the Ethiopian eunuch is in the book of Acts, and Philip is drawn to the Ethiopian eunuch who is reading from the book of Isaiah, and he helps him understand what it means. Philip then disappears, if God has him appear somewhere else. The, Philip, the Ethiopian eunuch goes back to his home in Ethiopia and takes the message of the Messiah to Candace, who is the queen of the Ethiopians. And so Ethiopia has one of the earliest Christian churches. Ethiopia, India, Egypt, all of these places developed churches very early on. The Coptic church in Egypt is one of the most ancient. So, um, the issue of China, China was not, had always been kind of, uh, what's the word, isolationist, and did not have a lot of, unlike India, did not have a lot of interaction with the rest of the world. Um, that's what I'm talking about here in terms of how God used history and civilization. That's not to say there weren't civilizations in other places. I'm saying he used the civilizations here and then later spread out. Um, he spread it into China. It's now believed there may be more Christians in China than the whole rest of the world. But we just don't know about it because of uh, the necessity to keep, keep a low profile. So, yes, the gospel did get there. God, in his wisdom through the Holy Spirit, unfolded it to, the China, to China, just like he did to the Americas. I mean, there was the Olmec Empire, one of the first of the Meso Mesoamerican empires, and others to follow. There was the Chinese civilization. So don't misunderstand me. I'm not saying... These were the only civilizations. I'm saying, starting here in Jerusalem, for very specific reasons, I believe miraculous providential reasons, the faith was able to unfold to what was to them the known world. China was pretty much set off. They didn't know the Mesoamerican cultures. When, they, when those cultures came to light in terms of uh, the Middle Eastern, you know, uh, Levant kind of understanding, the gospel spread there too. Does that answer your question? Is that, you know, I'm not talking about where there was civilization. I'm talking about how God used civilizations to convey the gospel to people. Yes? Well, you also have to look at one thing in the book of Acts when Paul when the, was wanting to go towards Asia and God told him no to go the other direction. 
Yeah, that's true, although he was talking about the province of Asia right. in Asia Not, Minor. Okay. Yeah, it would have been going more in the eastern direction. Yeah, uh, it's true. Paul was in Asia Minor on his uh, the uh, second missionary journey. He wanted to go north into what was Bithynia, or what was called Asia, which was part of what we call, what later was called all of Asia Minor, and God prevented him from going. We don't know exactly how he did it, you know, if he gave him a flat tire, if he, you know, uh, made him limp. I, we don't know exactly how he did it. But Paul said we were prevented from going there. And then that night in a dream, Paul has a vision of a man of Macedonia. Macedonia being northern Greece, as we know it. A man of Macedonia saying, come over and help us. If you go to Philippi, um, the, the ancient city of Philippi, the place that you land is now called, the town is now called Kabbalah. It used to be called Neapolis, I think. Anyway. Um, that's where Paul landed, and then he went inland a little ways to Philippi. In Kabbalah now, there, in the near downtown, there's this huge mosaic of Paul sort of reclining like he's asleep in this floating image. And it's a beautiful mosaic. I, I can bring pictures, I will. Uh, of this man from Macedonia inviting Paul, and then there's a, you know, Paul in a boat, and then there's Paul standing on the shore, and that's when Paul took the gospel to Europe. Because the division between Asia Minor, what we know as Turkey, and Macedonia, which was the northern part of Greece, what we know as Greece, that's the division between Asia and Europe. And that's how the gospel got introduced to Europe. Now apparently there were believers who had already gone to places like Rome, and again, the miraculous part of that is Peter's first sermon on the day of Pentecost. We're told that people had come from all Jews who had already spread out the diaspora, remember that, that God used the diaspora? that Jews had come from all over, including Rome and, and Libya and all over the world, back to Jerusalem for the festival of the Pentecost. Pentecost is not just a Christian festival. It's not just the festival of the coming of the Holy Spirit. It was the celebration the Jews had for the giving of the law on Mount Sinai, which is why it occurs 50 days after Passover, Pentecost, 50 days, because that's how long it took them to get from the Red Sea when they left Egypt to Sinai to receive the law. So, at Pentecost, Peter preaches the first great sermon after the Holy Spirit comes upon he and the others. He preaches the first great sermon, and all of these people from all over the world hear them speaking in tongues and recognize it as though it were their own language. Paul, or Paul, Peter, I mean, it's Paul saying, no, it's Peter. Peter, after preaching that sermon, calls people to believe in Jesus, and 3,000 people, most of them tourists, who were visiting Jerusalem for that festival, came to believe in Jesus as the Messiah. Well, what happened the next day? They went home. To Rome, to Libya, to Susa in Persia, all these places. So that by the time Paul goes over to, um, to Europe, that is, crosses over Macedonia, there already were Christians in Rome. Paul did not plant the Roman church. There were Christians in Rome. Priscilla and Aquila had come from Rome. They were already Christians. Apollo came from Alexandria in Egypt, was already a Christian. How is it that they got to be Christians? Because people left the, the event of Pentecost and took the faith that they had, they had received there back to their hometowns. Pretty miraculous stuff. John. You know, um, this is so fascinating to me because history, history is progressive. It lives. Mm -hmm. And when you look and see what God did through past history, you wonder, uh, what do we recognize in the history that we are making today? You look at where we are. We are the historical pages for the next generation. Yeah. <laughs> and you look at how the, the, Soviet, yeah. <laughs> so, you look how the Soviet Union fell. Mm -hmm. You look how there's this, this metamorphosis taking place on the Amer North American continent with our government. You look how all these issues with immigration, all these things are taking place that, that should awaken us to recognize that we are in the middle of a historical cauldron that allows us to do things that maybe our forefathers didn't do and our, our, those that follow us may not be able to do. We live in the same historical context that Peter and Paul and Stephen and all these others did. And the question is, do we recognize that yeah. you know, and do we take advantage of that? Yeah, um, a book that I'm using, that I'm reading and studying and really enjoying, that I also am using for the Life and Teachings of Jesus class, is called The Life and Teaching of Jesus by James S. Stewart. 
Um, it's a small book, and when I got it, I mean, it's like really tiny type. It's like, uh, and it, it, it looks like it's home published or something. You know, it's not, not very clear type, and it's tiny um, Times Roman or something. And I thought, okay, and I ordered it, and I thought, okay, we'll see what this is. It's wonderful. One of the things that Stuart does in this book is he draws parallels. I mean, he has some of the same kind of stuff like this that he talks about. Um, but he draws parallels between 1st century AD and the 21st century AD, or he was writing last century. You know, so it, uh, I think it was written in the 1950s or something, but it's very contemporary, it's very modern uh, reading. And um, that there are some similar, uh, quite a few similarities in terms of cultural things and the situation in the world. And I don't disagree with that, but I also um, I, I want to be careful because it has always been the right time for us to, to, to share the gospel. Okay, it's not as though up until now wasn't the right time, and you know next next Thursday is going to be too late. Um, we are told always for the last two thousand years our job has been to witness in. Judea and Samaria, you know, Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, um, and the uttermost parts of the world. That's our that's our commission. We are all soldiers in that army, and so. But it, you know, Stuart does the same thing. He draws some interesting parallels between the first century and now. At the same time, you cannot use history as an excuse to prevent you from what God has commissioned no. us to do. And some people will use that. Well, oh. it's just too hard. Oh, it's yes. just too difficult of time. No, yeah. It's never and, been too difficult. And you know what? I'll, I'll, I'll do you one better than that. Not only do people say, oh, well, it used to be easy and now it's really hard. You know, like the cult, everybody's so pessimistic and everybody's so negative and nobody wants to hear the faith. Everybody wants to hear the faith. They don't know it yet. Right. But they all want the satisfaction. They all look for that okay. God-shaped vacuum, as Augustine called it, to be filled in their hearts. Um, and, or, I'm sorry, that Pascal said. Uh, to be full in their hearts. And so, yeah, everybody wants to hear the good news, and our job is still to share it. But I would go one further than that and say that's true with everything. Not just when we talk about missionary endeavors. Everybody who says that America's going to hell in a handbasket should have been around in the 1930s, okay, or the 40s, or maybe the 50s, or they should have listened to music from the 80s, and then they would know that everything's falling apart, and we're decadent, and we're, you know, we're, we're dying on the vine. Um, there have always been periods, you know, it's always, as Dickens said, the best of times and the worst of times. And so, part of our job as Christians is to believe that God is never out of control. And when I hear Christians speaking politically, talk about how horrible things are, and it's really awful, and what are we going to do, no, oh, I'm going, do you not still believe God is in control? Because I do. I'm not going to panic about anything. There may be problems. There have been problems. You know what? There's going to be problems. God is still in control. So chill a little bit. Okay? We are people of faith, not people of fear. You cannot be a person of faith and a person of fear at the same time. Those two things are antithetical to each other. And we choose to be people of faith. And that covers everything, including political environment. Yes? I heard a, an interview with Bill Bright right before he died. And they were asking him about evangelization of the world and everything. And Bill Bright, who was, what, 70s or 80s when he died? Early 80s, I think. Mean. He, he said, I have never been more excited about what I see taking yeah. place in the world today. Absolutely. And, you know, that, and he began to share what was happening all over the world. He said, we don't see it in the States. But it's happening everywhere else. Yeah, and it's happening in the states too. Yeah, oh yes, yeah. yeah. very much so. We're, <laughs> yeah, we're being forced to take our faith seriously. Absolutely. Well, I, you know, again, people, it's easy for people, and in every age, people have said, "Poor, poor, pitiful me." You know, <laughs> wasn't it wonderful back then? You know, those were the good days. Okay, no, they weren't. Talk to somebody who lived in the Depression. I mean, my brother gets a magazine, you know, The Good Old Days, I think is the name of the magazine. And it's got all these pictures of the Depression and people canning and they're grinning. Well, the reason they were canning is because they couldn't afford to buy any food, okay? And that's not to say those were bad things, but, you know, we, we always have an excuse to feel sorry for ourselves or to feel defeated or to feel like, oh, yeah, this is horrible. God does not give us permission to do that, I don't think. All right? I honestly don't. We are called to, you know, to grow where we're planted. We are called to be servants and ministers and missionaries, evangelists, right now, right here in this environment, 
And this is the best of all possible worlds for us to do that because it's the world God put us in. To quote the philosopher Richel, who said, the best of all possible worlds is the world that really exists. This is the world that really exists for us. It's the best of all possible places for us to be in. Okay, here in, in the sermon, we're going to take a break for 10 minutes. Let's come back at 2.10. Two, two ten. Two ten. Let's get started back. I want to spend a little more time now talking about the specifically the Jewish environment into which Jesus came and into which the early church had to grow. I've given you that a little bit already, talking about the di diaspora. But again, we're talking about the apostolic age, which is from Pentecost around AD 30. I say around because we don't know exactly. And the, the dating of the years, for instance, when they first did the AD and BC thing, you know, Anno Domini, Year of Our Lord, BC before Christ, they got it wrong. Jesus was born sometime between 4 and 6 BC. So he probably died around 30 AD, and that was probably when Pentecost happened. So we just generally will accept those as dates. Between AD 30 and the death of John, the last of the apostles, around 100, that 70-year period is called the Apostolic Age, because it was the time in which the apostles were still alive. That's what we're talking about, and so let's, let's look a little bit about the historical context for the Apostolic Age in... In Palestine, that is in the, the first century Galilee, where Jesus did much of his ministry, the area of Judea, which is Roman-controlled Judea, which was also, which of course is where Jerusalem was, and then also something about Second Temple Judaism. It's called Second Temple Judaism because the first temple was built by Solomon, the son of King David. That temple, later on, uh, ended up getting destroyed. Okay. Uh, when, when the Babylonians destroyed the southern kingdom of Judah, after the two kingdoms had split, Israel in the north, Judah in the south, the Assyrians destroyed the northern kingdom, the Babylonians destroyed the southern kingdom, and they destroyed the temple. The Jews were carried off into exile, and then when they were allowed to return, when the Persians conquered the Babylonians and said, you can go back, that's where we get the story of Zerubbabel, and of Ezra and of Nehemiah returning to Jerusalem, rebuilding the temple, rebuilding the wall around the city, and sort of repopulating the Jewish population in Israel. Now, I want to spend a few minutes. That event of the Babylonian exile, it's called, which started in 586, when the Babylonian exile occurred to the Jews, it had a profound effect on the Jews which carried down to the time when we, uh, when Jesus came and when the apostles were there. So I want to talk about the impact or effect of that Babylonian exile. Um, it, as I say, was in 586 that Babylon destroyed Jerusalem, destroyed the temple, carried the people off. There actually were three deportations where they carried various numbers of people off. Um, this. This was what led up to the book of Daniel, for instance. Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, who were young Jewish princes living in Babylon. Now, when the Babylonians came in, they swept in, they destroyed Jerusalem, they destroyed the temple, it left the, the Jews of that time staggered. They, they were completely uprooted in terms of everything they believed in a number of ways. First, for instance, they had to ask themselves, does this mean that our God, Yahweh, the God of Israel, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, does that mean that our God is not as powerful as the Babylonian gods? Because a common belief in ancient times was that whoever won had the strongest gods. Because you served that God, and if you won the battle, your God was stronger than the other dude's God. And the Jews were really forced to ask themselves, does this mean that our God Yahweh is not the greatest of gods? Because they did believe there were other spiritual entities that existed in the world. In fact, if you were part of our Old Testament theology class last term, and you may want to go online and review some of that, we talked a lot about the, the uh, ancient religious beliefs, the ancient gods that existed in Canaan, Canaan being the, the pre-Israelite name for, you know, the, the pre-return name for that part of Palestine. There were Canaanite gods, any number of, number of them, right? The gods of the ancient Canaanites were, were many because there were a lot of different cultures around there. And um, one of the, I think one of the things that we can discover as we read the Old Testament, when we read about the fact that people like um, Jacob's wife, 
and stole the household gods from her father, Laban, and hid them under her saddle and sat down on them when they came looking for her and said, I'm having my period, I can't get up right now. And nobody could touch her because a woman having her period was unclean. And so that's how she hid them. There are other examples where various biblical characters, part of the people of Israel, had household gods. They were localized gods. The suggestion is that the Israelites, up until the giving of the law under Moses, were not completely monotheistic. Instead, they were henotheistic. Henotheistic means you believe that there probably are multiple deities out there, some greater, some less, but they chose to worship after Abraham, the one God that they believed was the creator God. But that didn't mean they didn't think there weren't other deities. And in, in our scholarly view of it, probably those were represented as you know, demons or angels. You know, they were spiritual entities. Our faith says there are other spiritual entities in the world. And so it wasn't until Abraham, and the very first of the commandments that God gave Abraham to share with the people is, you know, one God. Monotheism. And I think the reason he did that, and then he said, and you'll, you'll make no other graven images, God was saying, I'm the God you focus on, and you're not allowed to even fool around on the side with those other gods. Forget all that. Okay? Um, so there were other deities that existed, and the Israelites, even as late as the 6th century B.C., 586, the, the Babylonian captivity, the destruction of the temple, they had to say, well... Are some of those other, what we thought were minor spiritual deities, demiurges, demigods, whatever they are, are they really more powerful than our God since they won? And they had to deal with that. Second question they had is, does God no longer love us? Or does he no longer accept us as his chosen people? Have we been disavowed or unselected by God because he's allowed, allowed us to be defeated in this way? The third point that they had a question they had to ask is how do we now continue without all of the things that we thought were the symbols, the signs, the, the surety of us being elected by God? And particularly that meant the promised land and the temple. These were two things that God had given the Israelites as signs and markers that they were the chosen people. The promise from Abraham on down was, I will give you a land. And you will live there, and I will be your God, and you will be my people. And then the building of the temple, promised to David, manifest under Solomon, was a demonstration of God's power. That was supposed to be the place where God lived. The Holy of Holies was seen as the presence of God on earth. Didn't mean God couldn't be other places, but that was his special throne room. And it had been destroyed by unbelievers. How do we deal with that? Particularly, we need to recognize, uh, well, I'll put that in the next point. Um, the fourth point, they then had to say, okay, the temple's been destroyed. How do we even worship without a temple? All of our instructions had to do with sacrifice. And yes, we used to practice that in, in the tabernacle, in the desert. But once we came to the Holy Land, and God gave the promise to David, fulfilled under Solomon, that he would build a home for himself, literally the house of God. That's where that kind of expression comes from. And all of the sacrificial system was oriented around the temple. What do we do now that it's gone? Interesting to note, in this period from 586 to the 530s, it was only about 50 years that the, that the Babylonian captivity was in force before the Persians conquered the Babylonians. But again, most of the Jews never did return. Some did. But during that period of time was when the synagogue system was, was created by the Jews. Now, it's not true that there were no synagogues before that. Synagogues as places for prayer, etc. But in terms of a systematic replacement for the temple as being localized houses of prayer and worship and study and of community, that all was created as a replacement for the temple after it was destroyed. And so the idea was the sacrificial system wasn't done, but come together, we pray, we study the things of God. It was also, I'm going to talk a little bit about rabbinic Judaism, the thing that happened after the destruction of the second temple. After the Romans destroyed the temple in AD 70, they formalized this even more in what became known as rabbinic Judaism, where the emphasis, was, they, they took all of the oral history and oral law that they had and they wrote it all down. The development of the Talmud and especially parts of the Talmud, the, the Mishnah, came in 200 AD as a result of the destruction of the second temple. 
both times, after the destruction of the first temple by the Babylonians and the second temple by the Romans, the Jews were motivated to, to refocus themselves, not on the temple, not on the sacrificial system, not on the priestly system, but on teaching. That's why the Jews have been always, for the last 2,000 years, so focused on study. Why schools have been so important to them. Why every Jewish child was taught to read and every Jewish male was taught the scripture. That was the, that's where they put their energy after the temple was gone. The synagogue system. Okay? So this was a critical change in the way that Jews understood the expression of their faith. And then finally, they had the question, are we to be assimilated into a foreign culture? Because that's exactly what happened to the northern kingdom of Israel. Again, after Solomon and Solomon's apostasy, the kingdom was split into the northern kingdom of Israel and the southern kingdom of Judah. The northern kingdom had the worst kings imaginable. And because the northern kingdom no longer had access to the temple in Jerusalem, they came up with their own approach to how you worship. They said that we're supposed to worship here on Mount Gerizim, which was right outside uh, Samaria, the capital city of the north. And they even went in and changed the Old Testament so that there were 11 commandments in the law. The 11th one being, you are to worship me on Mount Gerizim. Mm -hmm. So the Samaritan Pentateuch, there is a Samaritan Pentateuch, their version of the Pentateuch of the Samaritan peoples, uh, which was the, the Samaritans are the descendants, that the sort of half Jewish, half something else descendants of the northern kingdom of Israel. Um, they struggled to figure out how we still be Jews during that period before Assyria destroyed them. And as a result of that, they allowed other gods to come in. They practiced what the whole world practiced prior to Judaism and prior to Christianity, and that is syncretism. Take a little of that religion, a little of this religion, that looks good, that tastes good, this will give us a good buzz. Let's put all this together into one religion. That's syncretism, and that was what was happening all during this time. The Jews wouldn't accept it, the Christians wouldn't accept it, but that was the common bond. That's why these mystery religions could be accepted. They bring them in, oh, you got an extra God? Fine, let's put his picture on the wall too. And nobody minded that except for the Jews and then the Christians later. So this idea, are we, the southern kingdom of Judah, where Jerusalem and the temple were, where the Babylonians destroyed Jerusalem and the temple, they said the northern kingdom of Israel, when the Assyrians destroyed them in 722 B.C., they got completely obliterated. They got assimilated, because the Assyrians did that when they conquered people. They forced them to intermarry. They carried them off into many different places. They brought foreigners in. That's why the Samaritans, the descendants, later on, were hated by the Jews, because they were half-bloods. They were not pure Jews anymore, and they practiced a weird kind of mixed mishmash of religion. It wasn't really Judaism. The southern Jews of Judah, after the Babylonians conquered them, said, is that going to happen to us? Are we going to lose our identity as Jews? Well, Babylon was much, the, the Babylonians were much more uh, generous in that regard. They allowed the Jews to remain in communities. They took them away, they deported them, but then they allowed them to stay in communities. So that when the time came for them to be reintroduced or the Persians allowed them to come back, there still were groups of Jews that could do that. When the Assyrians finished with the northern tribes, there were no groups of people left that could identify themselves as pure Jews. That's where we get the ten lost tribes of Israel. Because the northern kingdom of Israel, ten of the tribes were there. The southern kingdom was two tribes, the largest of which was Judah, and that's why the southern kingdom was called Judah. And so the ten lost tribes of Israel were the ten tribes that existed in the north that the Assyrians <clears throat> obliterated. And the southerners were saying, is that going to happen to us now? And that's another reason why the synagogues became so important, because the synagogues not only were places for prayer and study, they were community centers. They were places where Jews could come together and say, we are still Jews. And we share not just the, the Torah and the Tanakh, the Hebrew Bible, we also and we, we share not only our common history, but we share the fact that we are a people. And so the synagogues became a community center like probably none of us have ever experienced. It was the central stake around which the whole Jewish experience uh, was conducted. And that's why the synagogues became so important. They weren't obliterated because the Babylonians did not take the same approach that the Assyrians did, but the synagogue system was one of the reasons why they maintained that identity. And that's continued down to today. Joanne? So there is no longer the 12 tribes of Israel? There? No. In fact, 
Um, the, the, the two tribes that were carried off and brought back, virtually all the descendants that exist in Israel today are descended from one of the two tribes from the south. Boy, that says a lot about, about their conduct, you know, because you see how God comes against the north and how their kings were wicked and, and the end is the two are so, I mean, one is complete obliteration, the other one is exile. That's, yeah. that's incredible. Yeah, and in fact, um, the Jews have always had, this is another manifestation, I think, of the Babylonian exile especially, um, the Jews have always had a concept of salvation, but their concept of salvation is return from exile. Okay? Uh, always the idea has been that, that the ultimate salvation, the messianic age, which is part of the, part of the doctrine of the Jewish faith, is, is not going to be heaven as we understand it, it's going to be the great return. This is one of the reasons why to the Jews, the establishment of the nation of Israel and the return of Jews to Israel is a sign of the Messianic age because it's the start of the last age, which is the great return. Return from exile is, is the definition of salvation to historic Jews. Now, modern Judaism has become very liberal in most of its manifestations under <laughs> different schools, but that is the traditional. You know, Maimonides, again, as I've said, Rambam, 13th century, who established the most, the clearest articulation of what it means to be a Jew, had 13 principles or tenets that he established. And one of them is, there is a Messiah coming and he will introduce a Messianic age. And that Messianic age will be a return of the Jews to the Promised Land. Uh, Rich first, and then you Are the two and a half tribes east of the Jordan part of the ten lost tribes? Um, well, the two and a half tribes, you know, they're the, the half tribes uh, that were Joseph's Manasseh, sons, Manasseh and Ephraim. Um, yep. The... The, they would have been considered part of the south, yes, because the south. they're are part of the north. are part of the northern kingdom. Sorry, part of the northern, part of the north. Yeah, okay, yes, sure. because it was Judah and Benjamin were the two southern ones, so they would have been part of the northern. Yes. What's interesting is they in Israel they have the the museum of the diaspora. Is that how you diaspora. say that? diaspora? Diaspora, and it's a requirement when people come back to Israel when they bring them in for them to go and study that museum so they don't know exactly how they fit into the. Right. You know, and the Jews have established since the 1940s uh, the right of return, which means anybody that can demonstrate that they are of Jewish heritage can come back to Israel no, with no, require, no other requirements. You have a right to return there if you are Jewish. That's the right of return. The exception is, if you're a, a Jew by heritage who, is a, who has become a Christian, you're excluded. They won't let Messianic Jews come back. I know that because one of my clients is Jewish <coughs> Jesus, and they have had to deal with that. The Samaritans, um, there was some remnant of, of the Jews who then intermingled with people that lived there. Correct. Right? And so the Samaritans were seen as half-breeds right. by the other Jews. That's why in the time of Jesus, Samaritans and, and Jews didn't get along. Now, Galilee in the north was part of the traditional Judaism. And there were, you know, Jews had lived there. They moved up there. And that's where Jesus, of course, you know, lived. And that's where most of his ministry occurred. To get between... Galilee, the province in the north, and Judea, the province in the south where Bethlehem and Jerusalem and everything is, you had only two options. You either walked through Samaria, which was the straight route, but the Jews usually didn't like to do that because the Samaritans and the Jews hated each other so much, you're liable to, get up, you're liable to have a problem. Uh, instead, they would cross over, you know, from Galilee, they cross over to the Transjordan, which means the area east of the Jordan River, and go down that way, and then cross back over the Jordan when they got down to Judea rather than even have to bother with the Samaritans. That's why the story of the Samaritan woman at the well, when Jesus says, you know, will you give me a drink? And she goes, what? Why are you asking me for a drink? You're a Jew and I'm a Samaritan woman. You know, you, I got two strikes against me. I'm a Samaritan and I'm a woman. Well, that's because of the, the fact that Samaritans and Jews wouldn't even speak to each other. And yet Jesus broke down those barriers. Okay? Okay. Um... Oh, there's so much we can talk about. <laughs> I want to continue with this, the instability amongst the Jews. Another thing that the Jews struggled with is the fact that the last prophet of God, the last verified prophet of God, there were other people who came along who claimed to be prophets, most of whom ended up badly, especially at the hands of the Romans. The last prophet of God had been Malachi, who was over 400 years earlier, around 450 B.C. And so the Jews had gotten to the place, especially because, you know, the, I mean, Malachi was during the Babylonian exile, before they really, you know, it's, they, had, they had begun to return, but they still were struggling with that. Um, and 
during the time the Romans had taken over, they still didn't have a new prophet. And so the Jews were saying, where is God? The last person we had that we really believed was speaking for God. Because that's what a prophet is. A prophet is a, bless you, bless you. A prophet isn't someone who, who predicts the future. A prophet is someone who speaks for God. That's the definition. There had been a long history of prophets, people who spoke for God, most especially Abraham was considered a prophet. Moses, the great prophet and lawgiver. Samuel and on down through the line. Okay. 400 plus years, there had been no one to speak for God. And the Israelites were going, did he, I mean, did he go to Purnabayarna? Where is he? Where is God? And so, this is one of the reasons, by the way, that when John the Baptist shows up, John the Baptist got so much attention, people would go out from Jerusalem for the day to hear him preach, because John the Baptist was the first one in over 400 years to come along to present himself in the model of the Old Testament prophets. This whole thing with, you know, the, the hair shirt and the eating the locusts and the leather belt and the thus saith the Lord, they hadn't heard that kind of thing for 400 years. And so that's one of the reasons that they were so fascinated by John and why he got such a following, because they thought, here again, God has sent someone to speak. They didn't all like what he had to say, since he told them all they were sinners, but they recognized the fact that he was one who spoke for God. In a very real way, John the Baptist is the last of the Old Testament prophets, even though there was over a 400-year gap between Malachi and John. But he came in the model, sort of the bridge, and he came in the model of the Old Testament prophets in preparation for the Messiah who would come. And that's also why this question, where is God, is why for the whole Babylonian exile and the period after the return, to Israel, the Jews are saying, when, God, are you going to send the Messiah that you promised so very long ago? And even more so, when the, when the Romans took over, so that, the, you know, the, the Jews had been oppressed from by one people after another. The Assyrians destroyed the north. The Babylonians conquered the south. The Persians let them go back, but they're still controlled by Persia. Um, the, the Greeks come in under Alexander, and that after Alexander, Alexander was actually very nice to them. He was very impressed by the, the Jewish ritual and by the Jewish Bible, because the Jewish Bible said one will come from the, from the West who will conquer the Persians. And Alexander went, I'm here. <laughs> and he thought that was cool, and so he left them alone. But right after Alexander, we have the War of uh, the Diadochi, which is the, the successors, uh, Alexander died without an heir. There was a war between his followers and a boil down in, in terms of the effect on Israel. Um, in the south with the Ptolemies, one of the generals was Ptolemy, and they controlled the Palestine area for a while, and they were pretty easy going. But in the north, there was the Seleucid Empire. Seleucus, who actually had been a junior general who defeated one of the senior generals, took power, eventually conquered, and he was horrible. He forced the Jews to eat pork. He killed people for circumcising their children. He set up a temple to Zeus or a monument to Zeus in the temple. He had them sacrificing pigs in the temple in Jerusalem. Uh, he, I mean, he killed women. He would execute women publicly for teaching their children the Jewish Bible. You know, he was a horrible guy. Well, the Romans threw them out. Actually, the Hasmoneans, the Jews, rose up and got rid of them mostly, and then the Romans finished getting rid of them. Um, but all of this time, all of this oppression, all of this, you know, being conquered one after another, the whole time the Jews are saying, how long, O oh Lord? How long until you send the Messiah that you promised so very long ago? And so the messianic expectation was very great. In addition to the political oppression <coughs> that had been existing all this time, and it's fascinating, by the way, if you read at one point, Jesus is talking to one of the Pharisees, and the Pharisee says, we are Jews. We have never been under the control of anyone else. <laughs> and you go, Wait. where have you been? <laughs> the only time from, you know, the, in terms of a unified people, the only time since Solomon that they hadn't been, had somebody else threatened them or controlling them, had been for that very brief period of time of less than 100 years during the Maccabean Rebellion and the Hasmonean Reign, which were Jewish kings. Other than that, somebody else was always over them. But they didn't see it that way because of their independent streak. The idea that even though somebody else looks like they're in charge now, we are still the chosen people of God. Becky? So, I'm trying to get this straight. So, there's only 
the southern two tribes that are left, are there not groups of people who claim to be part of the other tribes? Or? There are. I don't know exactly how they trace their lineage now. Uh, it's a question I want to ask my Jewish friends. I don't think most Jews today identify which tribe they belong to. There's not that kind of link anymore, I don't think. Um, there were pockets of people, you know, uh, when the Assyrians conquered, there were pockets of people who fled south, who would have said, you know, I, you know, I'm of the tribe of Reuben, I'm of the tribe of whatever, but not of any significance. For the most part, the northern ten tribes, all but Judah and Benjamin, were pretty much done away with. So they could Go ahead, Becky. So they could have, the small pockets could have just gone back to the the larger tribes that were left just for safety? Or well, yeah, I mean, they fled south because the Assyrians were conquering the north and the south was still independent. Probably, in all likelihood, what happened then is because they would have been very small pockets of minorities and the only Jews that they had left that they could access were the larger groups of people from the tribe of Judah and Benjamin. They probably intermarried. And so they, they were assimilated as a tribe even though they were still pure Jews. Okay? Sure. I'll ask you later. It's okay. off topic. <laughs> okay. Um, and again, the reason why the Jews had maintained such tribal distinctions was because the Promised Land, the Holy Land, was divided up geographically according to tribe. And so different tribes lived in each different places. The reason why they, it, it wasn't forbidden, but it was strongly, uh, they were strongly discouraged from intermarrying between tribes is because it confused the geography. Because the tribe of Reuben had a certain geographical area that they had been given as part of the promise. And the inheritance. Right? And the inheritance associated with that. Okay, And so as long as you married within your tribe, then it was very clear that this tribe still owns this land. If the people from Reuben and the people from Naphtali, if, if you know the young folks meet and they start intermarrying, where's the inheritance anymore? And so the point is that when the northern kingdom was destroyed by Assyria and the small pockets of people fled south, there no longer would have been the strong motivation for them to stay separate as tribes because the tribal separation only made sense as long as there was a geographic separation and that didn't exist anymore. That make sense? Marvin. Any significance to the 12 tribes of God's chosen people, covenant people being intermarried, intermingled with all the other nations? Well, they lost their identity as Jews, completely. But this God got anything to do with, uh, with that? Well, um, God, you know, God has something to do with everything. <laughs> God is never out of control. I think I gave you that sermon a little while ago. And yet it was, it was part of the judgment. I don't even want to say punishment. It was the end result of the disobedience and the apostasy of the people of the North that they lost their identity. That was, that was part of the judgment against them. It wasn't just that they were conquered by another people, but they lost the promise of, of the promised land, of the inheritance, of their uniqueness as a people. That was the judgment against the people of the north and why they were watered down. Okay. And doesn't God only promise to keep a remnant necessarily if, no. they, if they disobey? Well, yeah. So, yeah, if they're gone, they're gone. Yeah, and exactly. I mean, God will maintain a remnant. He will not allow his faith to be completely wiped out, either in Judaism or in Christianity. But the uniqueness that those people had, the promise that they had received was that I will give you a promised land. That was the biggest single thing from Abraham on. When they ultimately, God had enough. You know, you, people have been apostate for how many generations now, and that's enough. Well, Jesus brought salvation to the Jew first, but then also to the Gentile. And it's mm -hmm. interesting that in, in those Gentiles, there is some Jewish blood. Yeah. In fact, I have Jewish blood. <laughs> I, I, I mentioned that the other day. I just did the uh, National Geographic Genographic Project, which means I sent them my DNA, the, the mouth swab, and they identified where I come from. Okay, um, and there's at least a three in four chance that I have uh, Ashkenazi Jew heritage somewhere in my background. Uh, they can't, it's not like they're going to say, okay, and in 1237, a guy named Bill married a woman named Martha. No. Uh, but, but they do give you a sense. They have, they have streams of genetic things, and so I have a sense of where in Africa the original genes for my mother and father heritage came from, and then where did that go from there? You know, so that... Um, my geographic type is closest to uh, people in Britain and Germany, as opposed to somebody in Tunisia or whatever. Okay. Although there's a little Tunisian in there, apparently. Yes? Is it true that uh, many of the uh, uh, Levites have been uh, designated uh, so that they can officiate in the ceremonies and the worship in the new temple? That's there, um, 
Yes, I don't have a lot of detail on that, but I do know that there is a party in, uh, in Orthodox Judaism that is planning for, actively <laughs> planning for, the rebuilding of the temple in Jerusalem and the reintroduction of the sacrificial system, which would require Levitical priests in order to maintain that. Um, I've read, just and not, not academic, not, not scholarly things, but I have read sort of anecdotal stuff that they are already, you know, they've already taken steps to recreate the, the priestly garments and all of that kind of stuff. Yeah. Um, now, the problem is that according to the Jewish faith, they cannot destroy another house of worship, even of another religion, and so they can't do anything. I mean, even if it was in, within their power, they can't do anything religiously to destroy the Dome of the Rock, which currently sits on this, the original site of the temple. And so they're expecting that at the right time, God will send an earthquake to destroy the Dome of the Rock, and then they'll rebuild the temple. We're getting off in sort of weird areas. <laughs> yes, go ahead. I might take you off a little bit weirder. Uh, I was on a missions trip in Jerusalem, and we had the privilege of seeing what you're talking about. It's kind of interesting to see the uh, the priestly robes and garments, right. and the ephod and the trumpets. They don't have everything recreated yet, but the most interesting thing is to listen to the lecture going along with it. Yeah. We were all sitting there saying, yeah, the Messiah is already coming. He's coming again. And they're just uh, way off. I cannot imagine reinstituting blood sacrifice. Can you? And they're serious about it. Yeah, they are, but our serious. Western sensibilities are very different than that. Okay, we got 15 more minutes, uh, and I need to, I got a lot of stuff I want to cover. So we talked about the fact that all of these different uh, forces oppressing the, the Jews, and then finally the Romans, all sort of, every time this something like this happened, it intensified their expectation that soon God is going to do something, and the thing he's promised to do is to send his Messiah. The Messiah was not expected by the Jews to be divine, okay? They didn't perceive uh, the Messiah, as we now perceive, because of Jesus, had to be a, the Son of God, you know, God himself, the incarnate. The expectation of the Jews was that, that the Messiah would come as an heir to King David, and he would be like King David in that he would be the great king that would once again make them a great nation, defeat their enemies, drive them out, and reestablish Israel the way that it was intended to be. So they expected it to be a man. Which is one of the reasons that the Jews have so much trouble accepting any idea that Jesus was a divine Messiah, because that's not what their expectation was. Okay. Um, now, one of the other things that, in addition to the Messianic expectation because of the Roman oppression and because of all these others, is that the Jews struggled greatly with the Hellenization of the Jewish culture and the Jewish religion. Hellenization means to be made Greek. Hellas was the ancient name for Greece. So when you read Hellenized anything, um, like Hellenized Jews, it means Jews that have come become influenced greatly by the Greek culture. They spoke Greek, many of them had Greek names, um, they, they liked to go, to go to theater, they liked to go to wrestling events, even though men would wrestle naked, and the Jews considered that an abomination, but the Hellenized Jews enjoyed it, so they would go to these Greek things. It's fair to say that there was a constant struggle in the Jewish people from the time of Alexander, when he first came through and said, okay, you guys are all right, I'll leave you alone as long as you don't give me trouble. From the time of Alexander in the 4th century B.C. until the destruction of Jerusalem in A.D. 70, there was a constant battle amongst the Jews themselves between the, their willingness to be influenced by the Greek culture. Some of them went whole hog into Hellenization. They became virtually Greek. Uh, they spoke the Greek language, they wore Greek dress, they liked Greek theater, they studied the Greek classics. They're then, because there were others then who felt as though that was watering down their Jewishness. It was watering down their Jewish identity, it was allowed to influence their Jewish faith, and so there was a huge battle here. That Greek influence on Jewish culture and the Jewish religion even, in terms of how they practiced it, ended up creating tremendous rifts which are very much present when Jesus comes along and are very much present when the first missionaries of the faith go out. Now, it's reflected in groups that you've probably heard of, but don't realize to the extent to which the Hellenized question affects this. The first group you will have heard of is the Pharisees. Pharisee literally meant the set-apart ones. They saw themselves as set-apart. They were the Jewish fundamentalists. 
they were of the common people. They were not wealthy. They were not influential. They were, they were blue-collar fundamentalists would be a, the best way for us to understand that. Now, the thing is, they maintained that the Jews had to hold a strict acceptance of the entire Jewish Bible, the Tanakh, and they opposed Hellenization. They opposed the Greek influence. They opposed the use of the Greek language as a dominant thing. Um, they were focused on acceptance not only of the whole of the Hebrew Bible, but how that Hebrew Bible could be applied to everyday life. They wanted all of Jewish life to be influenced by their faith, by their religion, which was consistent. It was, it was a theocracy back then, all right? Some of the things we read in the Bible and we criticize the Pharisees for, you know, like they had have, they have rules against what kind of bowl you could use and what kind of stool you could sit on and, and what you did on the Sabbath and all that. Yes, we see that as legalism and as a negative thing, and Jesus often spoke against it. The original motivation for all of that, which was also the motivation for creating the synagogue system during the, the Babylonian exile, the motivation for that was to try to make the, their faith in God a real, everyday thing that they could apply to all aspects of their life, which is why they made such a big deal out of giving one-tenth of all of their herbs and all of that kind of stuff, because they wanted it to apply to everything. It was a noble goal. The original motivation was a good one. But by the time Jesus comes along, the Pharisees have gotten to the point where they become all rule and no, you know, no cause. They didn't, you know, they've forgotten God in the whole process. But originally, the Pharisees were intending to make everything they did in their lives reflect their belief in God, which is a good thing. They, they opposed the Hellenization of the Jewish faith. Now, you compare those to the other group you've probably heard of, which are the Sadducees. Now, whereas the Pharisees were common people, and fundamentalists believing in the whole Bible, the Sadducees <coughs> tended to be wealthy, they were aristocrats, um, and they, they were usually in charge. The, Fer the Sadducees controlled the temple. They were sort of the temple sect. They also um, were the ones that were responsible for most of the seats on the Sanhedrin, the ruling council. And so they kind of ran things, even though they weren't, they weren't as dominant from a population point of view. And the Sadducees had a very different understanding. They took a very minimalist approach to the, to the interpretation of the Hebrew Bible. For instance, they put authority only in the Torah, only the first five books, the books of Moses. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. The rest of it, all of the writings of the prophets, the Nevaim, and the writing of the, the, the wisdom writings, the Ketuvim, eh, they could take them or leave them. They didn't consider they had any authority. They also had very different beliefs in terms of interpreting it. They did not believe in the resurrection from the dead, which is when you read, when somebody asked Jesus the story about, uh, the question about, okay, a man is married to a woman and he dies, and according to the law, the man's husband marries the woman, he dies, the next brother, uh, or the, the man's brother marries the woman, he dies, the next brother marries, you know, until seven brothers are married to this woman, and then they all die, who's married, who are they married to in heaven? Well, the, it's a Sadducee asking that question, which means he doesn't believe in the resurrection anyway. He's trying to make a point to catch Jesus. They didn't believe in the resurrection from the dead. They didn't believe in angels. They didn't believe in demons. They took a very loose uh, interpretation of even the things in the Torah. They were conservative politically. They thought they were conservative religiously because they thought all of these pharisaical doctrines, all the Pharisees' ideas about resurrection and stuff, they thought that was going too far in interpreting what was in the Bible. We think of the Pharisees as being the ultra-conservatives. But with regard to keeping a more historically traditional view of Judaism, actually the Sadducees were more conservative. Now when I think about them, I think of them as being liberal because they were, but in fact they were the ones that were trying to keep the status quo. And they were the ones that had the political power. Interestingly enough, the Sadducees were the Hellenized Jews. The Pharisees, one of the reasons they opposed Hellenization is because the Sadducees, whose doctrines they thought were all wrong, who didn't accept all the Old Testament Bible, the ones that were in charge and were rich and were the aristocracy and they didn't like, they were the Hellenized ones. And this battle between the, the, the completely Jewish Pharisees and the Hellenized Sadducees is one of the great battles. The reason why Jesus speaks out against the Pharisees more than he does the Sadducees is probably because the Sadducees all stayed in Jerusalem. Very rarely did they even go out because they were rich and had their houses there. 
and they ran the temple, and that's where the Sanhedrin was. The Pharisees were more the, the, the religious people of the people, and so Jesus was always bumping into them in Galilee and everywhere else that he went. Okay, So that issue of Hellenization, of the Greek influence, is one of the big things that separate Sadducees and Pharisees. I'll tell you in a minute what happens to them. Other two groups, which I'm not going to talk about long, the Essenes, who were responsible, we know them because they were responsible for the Dead Sea Scrolls. They are not mentioned anywhere in the Bible, but they were a, an apocalyptic Jewish sect, sort of cultic. They uh, believed that you know, the Messiah was coming and he's going to be really angry and nuke everybody else except us. And they, they set themselves aside in communities. They, they practiced abstinence and all kinds of stuff. They were the ascetic group. And then you have the Zealots, which were a political group. Simon the Zealot, one of the apostles, was undoubtedly a member of this group. The Zealots had interwoven their Jewish faith with their political aspirations, especially focused on getting rid of the Romans. One of the things, and I mentioned this recently either in teaching or preaching, I think it was in Bible study, um, the fact that Jesus had Simon the Zealot, who would have been radically, I mean, they were terrorists, Many of them were psychari, which mean they were dagger men, they were assassins. Many of the zealots. You had Simon the Zealot as one of the apostles, and one of the other apostles was Matthew the publican. A publican was a tax collector. He worked for the Romans. He was considered a, a traitor to the Jewish faith. Those were two apostles who traveled and ate, who learned from Jesus, who were brothers. That gives you some idea, the inclusiveness, and, and the fact that Jesus really did tear down all those barriers. Okay? So, um, these, especially the first two of those, are an example of the, the effect that the Hellenization had. Parties grew up within Judaism that struggled with each other, mostly over the issue of Hellenization. They all were still Jewish in terms of both uh, of being um, believers in ethical monotheism. You know, Judaism was the first great ethical monotheistic religion, meaning monotheism, they believed in one God. And ethical, meaning that, that you also needed to be moral. It made a difference in how you're supposed to live your life. Okay? There were Zoroastrians who were monotheistic, actually, um, um, who, but didn't have the, the ethical part of it tied in there. And they also had some kind of eschatological hope. Es eschatology is the end things. Uh, the Pharisees expected there to be resurrection from the dead at the Messianic age. The Sadducees expected that there was going to be an eschatological fulfillment when God drove off the enemies and made them another nation that was great, like the Zealots wanted it, etc. So they all had eschatological expectations. But there was this constant struggle between the Sadducees and the Pharisees, and the real difference was over their, um, the extent to which they wanted to be Hellenized. Um, skip through here, I want to give you one more thing about the Roman occupation and the effect it had. The Roman occupation and the oppression, it really rubbed against the Jews and their sense of independence. I told you a minute ago about the Pharisee who practically yelled at Jesus, you know, we're the Jews and we've never been under anybody else's control. Like, right, you know? Uh, but the Roman oppression smacked of both the Babylonian exile, and I just told you a few minutes ago what traumatic results came from the Babylonian exile, and the Seleucid oppression, that is the, the Seleucids, one of the generals after Alexander, from, they were centered in Syria, the ones that set up the Temple of Zeus and made them sacrifice pig. They made them eat pork, required it, would not allow children to be circumcised, would not allow anybody to own a, a Hebrew Bible. Those were two of the very horrible experiences they had under other rulers, and the, the Romans sort of renewed that whole sense that there's this foreign pagan, unbeliever force that's controlling us and controlling the chosen land, the promised land. Um, as I said earlier, it was economically almost unbearable because the Romans had taxes, Herod the Great had taxes, the temple expected to give them money, and people were suffering. Um, the, uh, the, as a result of that, there were frequent minor rebellions. Eventually, it would end up in the Great Jewish Revolt. What happened was, the priests in the temple and the Sanhedrin kept trying to keep balance. They were trying to keep the Romans satisfied, but at the same time, not let, you know, not let the Jewish people get out of hand. Well, in AD 66, the Roman army refused to step in to prevent uh, a group of sort of terrorists from destroying a synagogue in the north. As a result of the Roman army not, not stopping that, 
the priests and the Sanhedrin decided they were not going to pay the temple tribute to Rome. Well, one thing led to another, and four years later, the Romans came in and said, we've had enough of you uppity Jews. They destroyed the whole city, they destroyed the temple of Jerusalem, and the people, so the second temple was destroyed. This is the second time the temple's been destroyed. This was in AD 70, and again, the Jews were confronted with the same questions they'd had to struggle with after the Babylonians destroyed the first temple. Is God still in charge? Does he still love us? Are we still his people? What do we do now? The temple's gone again. Okay. Um, a lot of those same issues came up, and it would eventually lead to the final and complete split between Jews and Christians. I'm going to stop here and pick some of this up later. I'm only going to say this much. Christians, for the most part, continued to worship with Jews for probably for a hundred years after Jesus in many places, not all places. Jerusalem, with the stoning of Stephen, there was a, a persecution by the Jews of the Christians. The Jews were persecuting the Christians. That's what Saul was doing when he was converted in the road to Damascus. But many other places, every town where they had a Jewish synagogue and they had Christians, every town was different. In many places, like in Antioch apparently, where the first Gentile church grew up, uh, there was a sense in which the Jewish Christians still felt themselves part of the, uh, the Jewish community. They would still attend the Jewish rituals. They were Christians. They worshipped Jesus. But they still thought of themselves as Jews, and they still participated. Well, in 132 AD, um, back up here a little bit, 70 AD, the Romans destroyed Jerusalem and the temple. They deported a lot of the Jews at that point, another deportation. Jews kept coming back and filtering back. Well, one of the Roman emperors at that point comes along, and he decides, I think it was Hadrian, if I remember correctly, Hadrian decides he's going to rebuild the city of Jerusalem, but he's going to dedicate it to one of the Roman gods. Well, the Jews, again, a lot of them had come back by then. The Jews say, no, you're not. And so in 132, they have the Bar Kokhba rebellion. Bar Kokhba, the son of Kokhba. Uh, Bar Kokhba was, was believed by many to be the Messiah. You know, they did have these sort of false messiahs that kept coming along. And so the Jews rose up in rebellion. It, it was, they were defeated, Bar Kokhba was killed, uh, and the rebellion, you know, went away. But... The people who, the Christians, the Jewish Christians who were still participating in the Jewish community, that was the breaking point. Because when the, when the Jews decided to go to war again against the Romans, the Christian, the Jewish Christian said, no, we're not going to do that. And that was the last straw, the last break. Prior to that, for instance, um, there are writings in the early, the early Christian writers where some of the Christian uh, elders, seniors in the church, we're telling Jewish Christians, don't do, don't worship with those Jews anymore. I mean, if you read in the book of Acts, Peter and John, you know, the healing of the man born lame, they're on their way to the temple to, for their hour of prayer. So apparently, from that time up until the 130s, we had some, in some places, we had Jews, or Jewish Christians who were still worshiping with Jews. But that was the last break, the last straw despite the fact there had already been persecutions of Christians by Jewish groups in various places. It happened in Ephesus, it happened in Jerusalem, there were other cases of that. Um, I've got a lot of other things I could tell you, but it's 3 o'clock, and you all need to go home. Um, I may do about 10 minutes of finishing this up when, we're, when we get back together next week. Any questions or comments? I know this is a lot of stuff. Are you okay with this? Yeah. All right. If you think it's hard for you to hear all this, imagine how I do. <laughs> uh, but this is all background. This will sort of lay the foundation because now as I go along, I can refer to the Jewish expectation for the Messiah, or I can refer to the conflict between the Sadducees and the Pharisees, or I can refer to any number of things, and you'll understand how that fit into the rest of it. Next week we will start with the apostolic age in terms of um, you know, the, the, the particular Jew, Christian life. Just like yesterday, the introduction and background for the life and teachings of Jesus, I didn't really talk about Jesus. Today, the background for church history, I didn't really talk about the church yet. Okay? It was all about the environment and the things around it and it led up to it. Next week we will pick up with the actual church. Thank you all. God bless you. Have a great day.